Coming up on today's Airborne, the FAA approves fuel reimbursement for Young Eagles pilots with limits, Centurion engine production is back on track, and the SpaceX Grasshopper is learning to fly. Welcome to Airborne on Aero TV. I'm Ashley Hale. As we are wrapping up today's episode of Airborne, our newsroom got a late breaking story. Jim Campbell is here to report. Thanks, Ashley. We regret to report that a B 1 Lancer went down Monday morning in a remote area of southeast Montana. But the good news is that all four crew members are reported to have ejected safely, but with injuries. The aircraft was based out of Ellsworth Air Force Base in Rapid City, South Dakota, and went down near Broadus, Montana. With a crew of two pilots and two weapons systems officers, the aircraft was believed to have been based out of Ellsworth's 28th Bomb Wing. The 28th support some 60 remaining B-1 bombers, while Ellsworth also serves as the home of two of the Air Force's three remaining B-1 combat squadrons. Nearby residents in Echolaca, Montana, report that the town's emergency sirens went off between 9 and 10 a.m. to alert their volunteer fire department, while ranchers reported seeing the crew shoots before an explosion that occurred when the aircraft impacted the ground. Pictures of the impact area show little recognizable aircraft structures inside a heavily burned impact zone. The Aero News Network will follow up with news and details as they become available. For the Aero News Network, Airborne and Aero TV, I'm Jim Campbell. The FAA has responded to an EAA petition filed in April of 2012, which would allow volunteer private pilots flying Young Eagles to be reimbursed for fuel consumed during sanctioned Young Eagle events with limits. In its response, the FAA said in part, quote, a partial grant of exemption would be in the public interest. We acknowledged that the EFYE program is unique and designed strictly as a tool to familiarize the non-flying public with general aviation operations. For that reason, we find it is worthwhile to assist EAA's cause." End quote. However, the agency says at minimum, a private pilot certificate will be required for the exemption. Recreation or sport pilots would not be eligible. The EAA said in a news release that the Young Eagles and Advocacy Safety Departments are reviewing the exemption to determine what, if any, benefit it provides to the EAA member volunteer pilots who fly Young Eagles. Continental Motors Group, a division of AVIC International Holdings Corporation, announced Friday that its Technify Motors GmbH division has successfully renewed all EASA certifications required to design, produce, and maintain its successful line of jet a fueled Centurion engines. The certification renewal was required as part of the process to complete the acquisition of the assets of Tealert aircraft engines. The company says it will now concentrate on customer service, improving parts availability, and expansion into emerging economies. SpaceX's Grasshopper is learning to fly. On August 13th, the Falcon 9 test rig completed a divert test flying to a 250-mile altitude with a 100-mile lateral maneuver before returning to the center of the pad. The test demonstrated the vehicle's ability to perform more aggressive steering maneuvers than have ever been attempted in previous flights. Grasshopper is taller than a 10-story building, which makes the control problem particularly challenging. The test is part of SpaceX's program to develop a completely reusable space launch system, in which the main booster is recovered and refurbished for later launches. NASA is again prepping two Global Hawk UAVs for hurricane research as the peak of the Atlantic hurricane season approaches. Tom Patton reports. This will be the second year for the agency's Hurricane and Severe Storm Sentinel, or HS3, field campaign. The NASA aircraft will watch the environmental conditions near the storms and monitor the effects on their intensity. One aircraft will deploy drop sonds to measure atmospheric conditions over the 20-minute descent from altitude to the ocean's surface. The HS-3 mission will also measure Saharan dust in the atmosphere that can have an effect on how storms form and intensify. The Global Hawks can remain aloft for more than 26 hours. HS-3 will be flying the Global Hawks over hurricanes in the Atlantic, Gulf of Mexico, and the Caribbean over the next month. NOAA and the National Weather Service are still predicting an above-average Atlantic hurricane season, 
though they recently revised their official forecast, predicting fewer tropical storms and major hurricanes. For Airborne, I'm Tom Patton. Until recently, television traffic reporter Amelia Rose Earhart said she believed she had a distant family tie to Amelia Earhart. The famed aviatrix who was lost during an around-the-world attempt in 1937. But recently, she was forced to admit via a post on her Facebook page that a team of genealogists have not been able to find any connection to her namesake. This is supposedly a new development, but a former marketing director at what used to be known as Cirrus Designs, who had experience in genealogy, had checked out the relationship and couldn't find any. However, that did not stop the current marketing director of what is now Cirrus Aircraft from proclaiming the existence of such a relationship in press releases sent out last year. Despite this development, she still intends to continue with her planned around-the-world flight. Earhart plans to make the trip with a co-pilot in a Pilatus PC-12NG. If she's successful, she would become the youngest woman to fly around the world. You're watching Airborne, more in a moment. Since the early days of powered flight, pilots have struggled with landing in crosswinds and learning proper crosswind landing techniques. Even today, most crosswind landing skills are learned through trial and error, sometimes with disastrous results. Believe it or not, the most common contributing factor in weather-related accidents each year is crosswinds. The second most common factor is wind gusts. In fact, crosswinds and wind gusts cause more landing accidents than fog, thunderstorms, and icing combined. That's where the Redbird X-Wind SE comes in. It teaches pilots the proper techniques to meet and beat these top two causes of weather-related landing accidents. By placing pilots in gusty crosswind conditions for extended periods of time, the X-Wind SE gives instructors all the time they need to teach the pilot the proper techniques for landing in challenging crosswind conditions. For more information on Redbird flight simulations, the Redbird X-Wind SE, and Redbird's entire line of flight training devices, visit www.redbirdflightsimulations.com. Welcome back. If you'd like to suggest a story for Airborne, Aero TV, our website or our podcast, drop us an email to news by at aero news.net. Gulfstream Aerospace Corporation celebrated the 55th anniversary of the first Gulfstream 1 flight on Wednesday, August 14th. The twin engine turboprop was the first aircraft specifically designed and built for business travel. The company delivered 200 G1s between 1958 and 1969 when production ceased. The aircraft was used by many U.S. corporations for business travel, but also saw service with five U.S. government agencies in all branches of the U.S. Armed Forces. Today, more than 20 G1s continue to operate in the U.S., with others operating worldwide in several countries, including Canada, Mexico, Portugal, and South Africa. The G1's maiden flight took place August 14, 1958. Remember Light Squared, the company that sought to build a wireless broadband network it said it would be satellite delivered and then added high-powered terrestrial transmitters that would have interfered with just about every GPS currently in use? Well, they're back, at least in court. Harbinger Capital Partners, the hedge fund group that bought the assets of the company that eventually wound up in bankruptcy, has filed a $1.9 billion lawsuit against Garmin, Trimble Navigation, the U.S. GPS Industry Council, and the Coalition to Save Our GPS, along with the maker of John Deere Agricultural Equipment. Because they did not initially tell Light Squared that there could be an interference problem. In the complaint, Harbinger said that it would not have made the investment in Light Squared if the GPS industry had disclosed the potential interference problems between 2002 and 2009. The suit was filed in U.S. District Court in Manhattan. Eclipse Aerospace has announced a new package of safety enhancements available for existing Eclipse jet owners. The new safety enhancement package includes anti-skid brakes, auto throttles, a new independent standby display, and improved EFIS software, including the ability to display full-size charts on the current multifunction displays. 
The safety enhancement package is built upon the Eclipse Avio IFMS avionics system and is available for existing owners of Eclipse IFMS aircraft as an add-on package. Each week, we share with you a sample of an online video, one of our viewers thought was especially entertaining. We call it our Aero Video of the Week. Gliders are designed to fly without engines. They ride thermals to gain lift. But sometimes even an airplane with an engine, like a Taylor Craft, can do the same thing. It's called flying dead stick, as you'll see in this week's Aero Video of the Week. To view the full 7 minute video, search YouTube for climbing out dead stick. Cessna Aircraft Company announced this week at the Latin American Business Aviation Convention and Exhibition in Sao Paulo, Brazil, that the company has completed the first fuselage for its forthcoming mid-sized business jet, the Citation Latitude. The aircraft is expected to have a range of 2,500 nautical miles, permitting non-stop travel between Sao Paulo and Caracas, Venezuela, or from Santiago, Chile to Bogota, Colombia. The latitude is expected to have a maximum cruise speed of 440 knots. The aircraft will offer configurations for seating 7 to 9 passengers. The latitude prototype is expected to take its first flight in early 2014. Elon Musk, creator of PayPal, SpaceX, and Tesla, says he would like to see someone build an airliner that would take off and land vertically have the capability for supersonic speeds, and perhaps be powered by electricity. Musk said he could see a day when journeys of more than 1,000 miles could be undertaken by a supersonic passenger jet. While Musk says he has no plans to set up such a company anytime soon, as he has a full plate with projects such as a private mission to Mars, as well as other SpaceX and Tesla programs, he wished someone would do that, and if another entrepreneur doesn't come along and start such a project, quote, maybe at some point in the future I will, end quote. Sounds as if Musk's idea would be a cross between a Harrier jet, a Concorde, and a Chevy Volt. Well, that's our program. Remember, you can get comprehensive, real-time, 24-7 coverage of the latest aviation and aerospace stories at aero-news.net. And please remember, Airborne is streamed twice weekly and is always online. Join us again every Tuesday and Friday for a new edition of Airborne. I'm Ashley Hale. Thanks for watching.